So I'd like to introduce to you now Dr. Katherine Thomason. She is an environmental health consultant working to advance climate solutions. She was the executive director for Physicians for Social Responsibility and leader at Oregon PSR for 16 years an organization concerned with the gravest threats to human health and survival. Dr. Thomason is an internal medicine physician by training, and prior to her role as director of PSR, had interwoven her clinical work with advocacy work. She taught climate change and public health at Portland State University. Her undergraduate degree in chemistry and medical degree are both from Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. She's going to talk about climate and water impacts of unconventional oil and gas drilling. Please welcome Catherine Thomas. Thomason, sorry. <laughs> I knew it. I didn't even get it all wrong. There's that. Okay. And you have water. No. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Are you all awake? Yes. Fantastic. I think I have a mic that I can roam around because I can't see you. Um, so. You've heard a lot today, and I'm going to talk about a lot more. Um, and what I want to say first is if you can look at me and tell me that I like to eat, as we all do. And I have learned to cook vegetarian things, like ginger carrot salad or sweet potatoes with peanuts and tomatoes instead of beef, because we have 7 billion people on this planet that have to eat. And they can all eat meat, especially when we get to 10 billion people on the planet by 2050. So we have a lot we need to change. I am a physician by training. I don't think anyone should starve. But that's where we're headed. And that's why I work on this. Um, I think it's really important for people to link fossil fuel drilling and uh, fossil methane, also known as natural gas, with climate change. And I think that health professionals should know what are the health impacts of climate change. And that um, one of the things that haven't been talked about at this, um, in this forum that I've heard so far is about wet well water testing and what are our water issues, um, as well as the consideration of policies. And maybe we'll have a couple minutes where people can talk about what they think the policy should be that should change because we can't tell our patients to move away from a gas well. OK, so this hasn't been talked about much, but maybe everybody knows all about it. Um, there is potential water contamination. What is the biggest water use in Colorado? Right, 86% of our water in Colorado goes to agriculture. Less than 1% goes to fracking, but fracking can harm agricultural water. OK, so that's a big, important issue to think about. So oh, and I even have a pointer. Um, so people were sort of asking about, well, does, where does all the air emissions come from and the water problems and so on? Well, if done well, there shouldn't be, there shouldn't be any water contamination because the well that's sunk miles, a you know, mile or two down is supposed to have a cement casing all the way through the aquifer. Now, that's what is supposed to happen to prevent the stuff going down to get into the water table and the stuff coming back up to get into the water table. But you can have these ponds that are letting VOCs go. You have the backflow that's being um, held on site. You have spills that can occur. So there's a lot of other places for these chemicals to get into the water. Um, and, and we'll talk about some of those as well. So people have talked about all of these chemicals, so I'm not going to go over them. Um, the oil and gas will tell you that less than 1% of what goes down into the well is chemicals. Well, half a percent or a percent of 60, 6 million gallons is still 30 to 60 gallons of chemicals. And if you frack 10 wells, you have an Olympic-sized pool full of chemicals that is going down and then coming back up. Oops. You also have a lot of things that come back up with it. And that's important for your well water testing. You have salts 
those the ancient brines that Sandra talked about, radioactive elements, which um, fortunately for Colorado is less common in your brine than in Pennsylvania and other places, uh, but still there, heavy metals as well, and of course all the polyaromatic hydrocarbons um, that are part of what the oil and gas industry wants to come back up because that's what they're drilling for. So there's really only two states that require pre-drilling water testing, and Colorado was one of them. Um, they test up to four sites if they identify water that's being used by humans or animals to be tested. And um, they have to repeat that testing in between 6 and 12 months after um, fracking the well. And then they have to repeat it again five to six years later. OK? Um, Pre-testing is more extensive. This is what they test for. So it includes um, dissolved um, products that can be there naturally. So they want to know that ahead of time. That actually helps protect the oil and gas industry as well. Salts. Um, nitrates, um, manganese, magnesium, um, it's, and so on, total petroleum hydrocarbons, um, and then the, the famous benzene, B, the uh, BTEX chemicals as well. That's done initially, but that's not repeated. The repeat testing only includes the ones that are much more likely to occur from the drilling itself and from um, getting the hydrocarbons out of the ground. <clears throat> so, how well is Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission doing in terms of water contamination? Well, there's been 400 to 800 spills per year for the last eight years, averaging 573 per year. Now, the COGCC doesn't compile that data. They don't compile it in a way that says where it's the most likely place is it for it to spill or uh, whatever. All they do is they separate it in, in between a spill that's likely to affect a wa water source or not. Um, nothing has been done legislatively, so this is a policy thing, that could say, well, there are such toxic additives, maybe we shouldn't allow them. So that's something to think about as you're planning policy changes. So a um, group of researchers from University of Colorado took the data from COGC, see, the spill reports, which are put on, you know, you can look them up as well, but they're one by one and they're not aggregated. So they had to take, they, they aggregated that information for only the denver Julesburg Basin and found that 54% of the spill reports did not include the volume spilled. Well, you know, you kind of want to know how big the spill is, right? 82% of the spills, which are industry reported to likely impact water sources, did not have a volume amount. Okay? So, this study was presented to the Society of Petroleum Engineers, and you can get it online. Um, and it, it does look at where these spills are coming from. Um, they actually excluded all the potential spills that you saw the pictures of earlier, that condensate tank floating down the flood, um, because they wanted to see, well, what's, what's going on with business as usual? Um, they um, analyzed only the spills that potentially impacted water, groundwater or surface water. And of those, over the, the um, year period, 2007 to 2014, um, between 30 and 50 percent of the spills were determined to impact groundwater. And they showed the trend that actually, de that actually declined some over time. The most common problem was equipment failure. So the tank batteries, and I think of batteries and I think of something I put in my phone or, you know, my keys or whatever, but these are just holding tanks for the brine, for the oil, for the various things that are coming up out of this well. That is the most common place for a spill to occur. The second one is all these different lines. So they have lines that go from location to location on the sites, off the sites, gathering lines so that they can pull this uh, material together so that they can then put it in a pipeline after they've processed it. Um, only 
are from human failure or human error. Um, so they looked at this data, and 15% or more of the spills that occurred between 2007 and 2011 have not been cleaned up. They're just kind of waiting for them to see what will happen. Maybe, maybe they'll evaporate, you know, because VOCs definitely evaporate, and that's why we breathe them in, because they turn into a gas. Um, and they're not requiring them to be adequately cleaned up. Um, the studies that were, the spills that were found in um, 2014, uh, only 43% of them were resolved by the time the study was put together in August 2016. So it takes time for these spills to be adequately taken care of, and that's another potential policy. You know, should they be having greater enforcement um, of when they do know that there's a problem going on? Um, they were also recommended to require spill volume on all these spill reports, um, but it still isn't happening. Um, so. Before I go on to that, um, I have some of these in the back, but I, want, I would love everyone to go on to the um, uh, Environmental Health Projects uh, website, but there are some, so whoever gets there first gets to get a copy. Um, this is for clinicians. This is for telling people, test your well. You can buy a gizmo that tells you what the conductivity is. What is will it um, take electricity through it because it has more salts in it? And that's a marker that it potentially has been contaminated from a spill. Okay, so that's something that individuals can do. And this is for well water. So well water is not required to be tested except by the owner of the well and the, the times that they're tested in this, these circumstances. Um, so the next problem is what happens to all these other wells? Um, What's called an orphaned well is when a company actually walks away from a well. Um, no one owns it. It's now an orphan. Um, the company's gone bankrupt. The most amazing case was one that I found from Adam Petroleum, who actually bought 50 wells online from a previously bankrupt company, thinking they could get more oil and gas out of those wells, which maybe they could, which they did, actually. So they worked those 50 wells. Um, but they had a lot of fines. They had a lot of violations. Um, and they were actually told to take out a bond. So a lot of companies are required to take out bonds so that it covers them in case they lose money or they have a spill and it has to be taken care of. Well, they didn't take out the bond that was recommended. Um, and one, they were one of the few companies that the COGCC said, we're revoking your license to, to drill, to it, it take extraction. Your, your permits are now revoked. Um, so unfortunately, the state doesn't have the money either to take care of these wells. Um, so there had been a trade-off previously on how hard to push these small companies to make them manage the violations that were there. So that's another policy issue. How many inspectors are there? How, many, how much of this hardware is actually being looked at? Um, and how much compliance is being required? Because if you take away their ability to produce oil and gas, then they don't have money coming in. So, but, but it's also a political question and requirement as to what we want. Um, so it's estimated that there are 244 known orphaned wells in Colorado. Um, and another 400 likely, according to the report I read from state officials, that they haven't really located or identified. Um, and there's a, a fair amount of cost in what they do is they pour cement down the hole so that it plugs it all up so that you can't get the steel casing will eventually erode, corrode, and leak. Um, but even those that have been capped in that way are still leaking. So that brings me to the second part of um, my talk, which is on climate change. So I think this statement should be written down by everybody. This is a statement that has been um, created 
and refined by communications experts at Yale and George Mason, that when used, not with diehard deniers, but with skeptics, opens them up to hearing you more about climate. You don't have to be the climate science scientist, right? I'm not a climate scientist. 97% of all climate scientists concluded that human-caused global warming is happening. Okay, that's a really important statement. Okay, now if 97% of nurses and physicians told you that you should treat strep throat with penicillin or an antibiotic and you're a child, you would do that for your child, <laughs> right? So this statement is a really important statement because we have a health emergency. Climate change is a health emergency. So this opinion paper went along with a 14-page paper that you also can download for free from the website on health impacts of climate change from the January 19th New England Journal of Medicine. So what are the top three heat trapping gases? I won't call them greenhouse gases because we all like our greenhouses. Heat trapping gases. Shout them out. Methane, carbon dioxide, ozone, water vapor is number one. Uh, carbon dioxide is number two, methane is number three, and ozone is fourth or fifth. Okay, so we're talking about the top ones. Nitrous oxides are right up there as well. And what are they doing? Well, they're making everything hotter. So the global annual temperatures over the last century have gone up by a full degree centigrade, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. There are parts of western Colorado where the global annual temperature has gone up by 3 degrees Fahrenheit. So it varies from place to place. Less so in the tropics, more so in the Arctic. We are going to see, and we are seeing, greater heat waves. Denver, because it's a city with a lot of asphalt and few trees, has a heat island effect. And it's one of the greatest differences. Yeah. And how many people have air conditioning? OK, so you have to think about who's impacted. Well, definitely the elderly. Definitely the very young. Definitely people who have other illnesses that make them more, uh, have more problems when, they are heat when it's hot outside and they can't cool off. I wouldn't want this gentleman working in my electrical wires. Um, so occupational workers, migrant workers, people working in the fields are all greatest impacted by these um, heat waves. How many people have treated um, heat stroke? Okay, a couple people work, have worked in emergency rooms. <laughs> I've had heat exhaustion playing tennis in Florida. Um, so feeling overly sweaty, um, dizzy, palpitations. But when you get to heat exhaustion, you can't sweat anymore. Your core temperature starts to go up. You become cused, uh, confused and become unconscious. It is a health emergency. And that is happening at greater rates as we increase. So if we don't do something about it, people here in Denver and in Colorado will be like living in southern Texas. So, and the summer temperatures will be warmer than the um, winter temperature. So Detlef talked about ozone. Other people have talked about ozone. Um, it is created in our um, atmosphere in the ground level ozone, not that wonderful stuff that blocks the ultraviolet light from coming through, but the ground level ozone is a heat trapping gas. Um, and that's a picture of Denver. Um, it can create sunburn in the lungs. Okay, that's kind of how I like to think about ozone. Um, it exacerbates asthma, other health and heart, uh, um, lung conditions in terms of exacerbations. Studies with prolonged ozone elevations um, definitely reduce fetal um, birth rates or be, fetal size at time of birth, um, particularly when women are exposed in the first and third trimester. Um, so it's, it's really a significant problem. Um, another major problem for Colorado is that with global warming, dry areas are going to become drier and wet areas are going to become wetter. 
Okay, and I don't understand all the science behind it, but that's what the client, climate scientists tell us. Currently, 64% of Colorado is in a drought of some variable level, the darker colors being the more severe. But climatologists and people who study this feel that this is becoming the norm. And it's becoming the norm because we're losing some of the ability to um, maintain our water sources. Um, and the Colorado River Basin itself is becoming more arid. Um, as our temperatures warm, the 70% of water that Coloradans get from the sky comes down as snow. So snow melt is happening fully, full snow melt is happening 15 to 30 days earlier than it used to. That exposes the ground, just like the oceans around the Arctic, to more warmth because the ground, as opposed to the snow, absorbs the warmth instead of reflecting it back to the sky. Um, that dries out the soil, and so you get fire time problems sooner in the season than we had before. Um, it's estimated by um, the World Health Association that we will lose half of the world's readily available fresh water by 2100 if we don't take action on climate change. So this is a picture of the bark beetles infestation and killing trees here in Colorado. Um, I went over this. The um, pine beetle is not being killed off with really cold temperatures in the winter. Um, they hatch more. Um, they can infest. Uh, trees more easily when the trees are drought strained or stressed. Um, and then, of course, we know what happens when fires occur. We have bad air. We have really bad air. Um, and, you know, what do you tell your patients when to go outside? You know, it's a combination of particulates and ozone. So I, I only printed out a few of these, but having a handout, if you're a clinician, a nurse in your clinic, or a thing to put on your wall, is to say, Climate change is going to make our air worse. I want you to know when to keep your child who has asthma inside, right? Or your preschool to do that. Um, or when it's bad for everybody, when the particulates from wildfires and the ozone are both high. It's expensive. So there have been numerous economic studies that show that if we address climate change now and invest in healthier ways to produce electricity and heat, and transport ourselves, we will have less billion dollar weather events. So these are the 11 billion dollar weather events that occurred in 2018, including one here in Colorado, which was a hailstorm. So these are the impacts of climate change economically as well. And in this area, we have a, in the southwest region, there's actually 29% increase in high precipitation events. Um, in spite of the drought that you're all seeing. Um, increasing ragweed season, um, plants like CO2, they grow faster, they produce more pollen, but they actually produce less um, protein. So our greens are having less protein. There's vector-borne diseases, mosquitoes, up to a certain point like it warmer and more humid, um, as do many other in, um, organisms that carry uh, viruses and such, uh, chikungunya, dengue, uh, malaria, and so on. Huge agricultural harm, and I actually put some handouts on climate impacts on agriculture, because I know I don't have time to go through this. Um, on the back table that you can also find at the PSR website under resources. Um, we don't air condition our chicken facilities or our cow facilities, um, and so in the 2012 severe drought, that impacted 67% of cattle production across the country. High nighttime temperatures reduce rates of milk and egg production and grain yield. And all of these things make food costs go up. And that's a global problem, as you can see here. So the number of migrants that are happening because of drought, flood, loss of food, conflict. Syria conflict happened after four years of severe drought in a country that previously always fed itself. They did not have to import grain. And the impacts on mental health. 
The people who were in Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane Sandy were traumatized, especially children. So I'm not going to go through this. And there's a handout in the back on climate change as well. We're approaching a tipping point. Um, we have typically negative feedback loops. When we get hot, we sweat and we take our shirt, our jackets off, right? When the planet gets hot, it actually creates more heat trapping gases by melting permafrost or more absorption from the sun in our um, non-ice areas. IPCC, Lancet, National Climate Assessment all agree, as did the Paris Treaty, that we should be limited to 1.5 degrees centigrade. That means we've already gone up one degree. We can only really go up another 0.5. Otherwise, we're really setting off tipping points that will make it much more difficult. So policy, we have to cut global greenhouse gases in half by 2030 to meet this target. So do we want to drill more? <laughs> you know, that's, that's the existential question. <laughs> um, how many people have gotten rid of natural gas in their home? A few people. Heat pumps are fantastic. And this methane leakage, which we don't have time to go through, is huge. Um, it's as bad in some people's minds as coal. But it's still burning and creating CO2 even when it's burned. Um, cut the beef. Um, um, lots, of, lots of ways. We have the technology to do what we need to do. We need the political will. And it's a cash crop for Colorado. So Excel is shooting for 55% wind energy, electricity by um, 2026. Ground sourced heat pumps in all public buildings, in all new schools, in all new hospitals. And there's my new heat pump. So there's lots of resources. Um, I'll leave that slide up. I know that you've been hearing about PSR, but there's a lot of groups here who are working on these issues that are so important to um, have us all working together so that we can create policy change in the legislature. Thanks. I don't need any. Do a couple quick questions. We're a little over time, but we'll, we can take one question. Yep. It's not on. Hello. Thank you. We'll take one question, even though we're just a little bit over time. So, um, fracked wells um, really release, there's not a whole lot of water or gas release from the two miles down. It's really all the stuff that's coming up the well bore, um, when the wells are dug well, and it's very deep. Um, so it's the intensity, it's the, the fracked well. Um, as somebody mentioned earlier, the completion isn't capturing the methane. There's more leakage at the well site of these volatile organic compounds that come up along with methane. Um, so it's. Um, it's, 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 a, it's also volume. Um, so those are kind of the differences, but I'm not an engineer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. <clears throat>